I was really depressed. Didn't want to go on. It was like within that month, I felt great. Started like really having a positive outlook on life. After becoming carnivore, it just, I look at them now and I'm, I, I, I'm, I kind of laugh and I kind of feel sorry for them because I was like that too. When I was vegan, if I met me today, back then, I'd fist fight me. I, w- I would fight myself because I would call myself, you're such an idiot. What are you doing? Why are you eating meat? And I was that guy that was in a restaurant and was kind of like, ugh, look at that meat eater, you know, like this tofu is so delicious, you know, like, and, and it's like a religion, I guess, you know, like uh, if uh, your, your whole life you were taught that uh, blowing yourself up in the name of a deity will get you into paradise, you're going to believe that. You have no mental defenses at that age. And- okay, good morning, folks. Uh we have uh, today with us uh, Pavlos. Pavlos, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly fine. We're, can well, you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Well, welcome. Thank you for doing this, by the way. Where are you located at? Uh, right now, I'm in Crete. Are you, you in Crete? Know where Crete is. Yeah, yeah. Island, island. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Out there. Yeah, How do you like yeah. Crete? I've been living here for about 10 years. Yeah, it's great. It's really great, especially if you're a, a meat eater. Uh-huh. What are, wow. What, what are <laughs> really, really great to be here. Is lamb, lamb the specialty there? Yeah, absolutely. Lamb, uh, there's, I mean, there's uh, the worst kind of traffic jams that we have on Crete is, uh, you know, waiting for the shepherds to cross the road with their flock of a couple hundred lamb or sheep or goats or whatever they have, you know. Uh, yeah, tons, tons. Very, very nice. I'm, 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 I'm heading to Greece uh, this summer, so I'll be in that. Next wow. Month, so yeah, you should definitely visit Crete. Yeah, it's really great here. We'll stop over there. We haven't finalized everything, but uh, we're going to spend some time in uh, Athens and Marathon and stuff. So, um, well, awesome. well, it's and are you from Greece? Is that? I mean, I was just looking at your last name. Looks like it's a Greek last name to me, but I don't know. Maybe. Not. Yeah. So my ancestors were from this island. Uh, my grandfather, my father were born here. Uh, my father left when he was relatively young. He was seven years old when he. Um, there was like uh, right after the war. Uh, there was like a civil war as well. There was like it was really, really, really bad time to be in Greece. So. Uh, my grandfather took his whole family to Montreal. They emigrated there, and uh, my mom left Greece when she was 18, so about 10 years after my dad, and they met uh, They met in Montreal, and uh, Rest I, I guess that's uh, that's that. And you and you decided to move back? Yeah, I mean, that's actually, it's a, the interesting story. I, um, I, I was diagnosed with uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Mm, okay. uh, this was in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I was... Uh, I was very lucky to be dating a dermatologist because I always had this kind, these kind of little, like little dry patches on my skin. Maybe not always. Maybe from the time I was maybe seventeen years old, I, I just thought there was some sort of psoriasis or mm-hmm. whatever, and they would present themselves right around my groin. So nobody, nobody would ever would ever see them. Like nobody would ever say, "Hey, you know, you should get that checked out." And uh, me being not very careful with my health, I don't really get checkups or whatever. So she was like, "You know what? That's." Uh, you should go get get that checked out. You should come over for a biopsy. I said, okay, no worries. So I went to the clinic that she was working at. She was working at the Montreal General, I believe, the Montreal General Hospital, and took a biopsy. And yeah, she um, she, she was right. It was like it was a CTCL. And uh, from that point on, um, you know, I would go back to the clinic where you know, in Canada, Canada's got some really great things about it, some really bad things about it. But the great thing about Canada is that, you know, once, if you have something serious, like health wise, you get good care. When I would go into the clinic, I, w- I would, you know, I would meet five doctors. I'm sure. Like two of them were like interns, but you know, the head of oncology, the head of dermatology, you know, like they were, it was like a little council of doctors that were uh, meeting with me. And uh, they told me, oh, this is what you have. It's type of cancer. And, you know, when you hear cancer, you're like, wow, that's, that's crazy. But from what they told me was out of all the types of cancers, it's kind of the best one to get. It's like not really that serious if you keep on top of it, if you try to manage it. And what they recommended I do was um, UVB like therapy, uh, a lot of omega threes, omega nines, lower my stress. At that time, I was working, you know, 16 hour days. I was running three businesses and I was super stressed. There was a bunch of other stuff that was happening in my life as well. Uh, I had just gotten a divorce. One of my businesses were not, was not doing that great. It was going under. My partner started being uh, a little bit hard to manage. So, like, they're just, it was kind of like a perfect storm of 
of events. And I just decided to take a month off and, you know, go to Greece. So I decided to come to Crete and I left end of October, the last flight from Montreal to, uh, to Athens, which was completely like almost completely empty. Probably the cheapest flights I've ever bought in my life, $260 to go from Athens to uh, from Montreal to Athens. And I stayed in Crete for the whole month of November. And every single day I was suntanning, eating fish, you know, uh, low stress. And uh, it was just every single day suntanning, every single day hot. It was fantastic. And uh, the day before I was set to go back to Montreal, I was lying on a beach. Half my body was in the sea. The other half was on the sand. The sun was just radiating on me. And I was feeling like this really intense energy flow. And at that moment, I told myself, um, I'm, I don't want to go back. You know, I'm done. So I went back. I, you know, decided to do whatever I can to settle my affairs. And after about a month, I came here and I haven't been back since. Wow, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine laying in the, getting sunbaked out in the sand and the ocean. And uh, yeah, especially when to, in Montreal, like yeah. people are miserable in November, you know, it's like right. slushy and rainy and yeah. people are like, you know. Yeah, I get it. I get it for sure. Exactly. So let me, because, you know, you've got this cutaneous T cell lymphoma, which, uh, you know, is a type of cancer. You know, in advance, it can be deadly. I mean, people do die from this. Um, how how do they treat it? What was the treatment options for you, and, and how did that go? So they wanted me to come in every other day to do UVB light therapy. They wanted me to, uh, to start, you know, reducing my stress levels, which in Montreal, response for 21, you know, salaries is really, really hard to do. Yeah, just eating more uh, olive oil. Omega nine is oleic acid, right? So they wanted they wanted me to really up my oleic acid intake, my omega threes from fish or whatever. Talked to my girlfriend at the time, and wow, am I ever lucky uh, that 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 I had her in my life at that time? Uh, I told her about Greece and how wonderful it was getting you know sun and whatever. She's like, you know, you could try to pursue what we call a climate based therapy, uh, which means just change your environment and go somewhere where you don't you don't have to lie underneath you know, lights uh, for, uh, it, in essence, it was a, a sun tanning bed, right? So it's usually lights just hitting you every other day. I decided to move here and get as much sun as I possibly can. I actually um, came across this because, you know, it's, it's hard to get sun right around your groin. In Greece, Greece is still very conservative. You know, there aren't, there aren't nudist beaches. There are some, but, you know, you, you can't. Plus, you know, if you're not used to going to nudist beach, I was like, I'm not, I'm not used to going to nudist beach. I don't want to go and uh, suntan naked, you know, but I found this really cool company called Kimiki, which makes a type of see-through bathing suits. And so UVB light can get through. So I bought a pair of those and I just started suntanning as much as I could. Uh, my dermatologist over here told me that the best time was between 10 to 12. And I started teaching online. So I would organize my schedule. So to have that kind of gap where I would stop working I'd go outside, get my sun, uh, I upped my, my olive oil intake because, you know, Crete is, mm -hmm. Crete's the, uh, the, the jackpot of olive oil production in the world. It's, uh, it's a, some of the best olive oil, if not the best in the world. And I'm not saying this because I'm Cretan. I'm saying this because I've had olive oil um, and I, I make my own olive oil, actually. And it's uh, for, for me, it's, it's the best I've ever had. So, uh, so I started eating a lot of fish, a lot of olive oil, getting a lot of sun. And yeah, soon the uh, the patches became smaller. Uh, at first, they became uh, from white and flaky. They became kind of more red, more intense, kind of blood like. And from that point, they just started like shrinking and shrinking. And finally, after about two or three years of doing that, they were hardly noticeable at all. Um, I haven't I haven't actually noticed any kind of patches. And 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 I've been kind of like really lax with my sun exposure, but I haven't noticed any patches for the past two years now. So. For all intents and purposes, I think I'm, I'm good. Well, good. That's good to hear. And so um, you, you made some overall dietary changes as well with, with, with this, or how did that go? Yeah. Here's, here's the other funny thing. Uh, when I got diagnosed, I was vegan. Okay. And for all the wrong reasons, you know, like I was, you know, kind of like woke, you know, I was like the, the kind of environmental warrior, you know, changed through. Uh, through action, through doing what, to, changing yourself to change the world, all that kind of stuff. But everything I believed in, I mean, I, I, la I later learned that it was horse crap. Every reason that I chose to become vegan was just wrong. But when I got diagnosed, I had been vegan for about a year and a half. When I moved to, uh, to Crete, 
just randomly, uh, you know, I was living in a village. I was kind of a little bit alone. I was kind of feeling lonely. So I started looking up friends, trying to find old girlfriends, whatever, you know, old classmates. And through Facebook, I found my best friend who was living, uh, who, who we were best friends from grades one to four. Mm-hmm. And off and on while I was in Montreal, I would meet up with him once in a while, but we lost touch. It had been about maybe 10 years that we haven't spoken that we hadn't spoken. And I found him on Facebook. So I said, Hey, what's up? How you been? Where you at? You know, he's like, Oh, you know, if I've moved that I'm not long, I'm no longer in Montreal. I said, where are you? He's like, I'm in Malia. I'm like, Malia, you mean, you mean Malia Crete? He's like, yeah, I'm in Malia Crete. I was like, I'll see you tomorrow. So he's like, what? So, uh, yeah. I, I jumped, I jumped in my car. I went to go visit him and I was still vegan at the time, by the way, I'm still, I'm still like Mm -hmm. uh, upping my olive oil, you know, uh, eating a little bit of fish now because my doctor said I have to eat fish, but I'm still kind of like really, you know, holding up that flag, you know, that veganism flag and trying to be like, you know, environment needs us. Mm -hmm. So I go and I visit him and, you know, after catching up a little bit, uh, we got on his scooter and we start driving up the mountains of Crete. And uh, we get to this little village where, you know, back 10 years ago, Crete wasn't, I mean, it's been developing a lot the past 10 years, but it was very common to find um, tavernas, which are like eateries, which are literally a guy's house. He's got a yard. He's got his goats and chickens and things in the back. And and he he serves you uh, in his front yard. So we go to one of these places and uh, he comes and asks us what we want to eat. And I said, what kind of vegan options do you have? He's like, well, we got we have you know salad and boiled greens, and that's it. My friend looks at me. He's like, oh, well, by the way, I didn't ask you why are you vegan. I'm like, well, you know, I don't like the way animals are treated, and I don't like the whole like, you know, like industrial meat production and health and whatever. He's like, come with me. So we stand up and we kind of walk around the back of this guy's house, and he says, you know, the uh, the chicken that's on the menu. Uh, it was it was right here, you know, like those chickens uh, are the chickens that are on the menu. Do they look like they're suffering or they look like they're I'm like, no, they look pretty happy. They call the goat that's on the menu. That's that's where the goat grazes in the back in the field. You know, does that goat look like it has a bad life? I said, no, not really. Like, uh, so well, your your reasoning is a little bit, you know, illogical in this situation right here. I said, you know what? You're right. And I said, I'll I'll eat some. I'll, eat, I'll, I'll, I'll have some rooster. They had rooster with the. Uh, with a red wine sauce and little like these these handmade uh, uh, little pasta. It was a it was traditional kind of Cretan dish. So we order that, and after the first bite, I was like, "Wow, oh my god, this is you know incredible, insanely good." And uh, that was the last time that I told anybody I was vegan. That was the uh, that was it for me. But I mean, the, the story doesn't end there. Like, there's still like the transition that took me towards carnivore, uh, which happened years later. I had met uh, this woman uh, in Montreal before I left, and she had come to visit me uh, in Crete, and she was also vegan. And we got together. We had a kid. Long story short, she doesn't like it in Crete, and she decides to move back to Montreal, taking our kid with her, not really telling me she wants to move permanently. Like I was in a really really bad state of, of depression and bad, you know, state of, of mind. That's kind of when I came on to, when Jordan Peterson came onto my radar, uh, you know, people like Bill Burr, people like uh, Louis CK and you know, all those kinds of that, that kind of like personage. Yeah. And I was listening to podcasts and, you know, I was reading Jordan Peterson's books and trying to get, get out of this depression. I had seen um, Joe Rogan. And uh, Michaela Peterson, I saw I saw that podcast, and she was telling she was talking about how you know like carnivores kind of healed her, and it kind of made me think about my situation a little bit, where I'm kind of fighting this kind. Of, I'm not fighting it, but I've had this I've had this kind of condition for at that time it was eight years plus, and just it, it's like the kind of perfect storm. I was hosting somebody. Uh, cause I, I was living in this big house, you know, like it was just me now. It was my, my woman, my kid were gone. It was just me in this big house. So I decided to open my doors and start inviting people into my house to stay uh, as couch surfers or work or, um, just to have somebody around. And one of the people that 
requested to come stay with me. Uh, her name was Lauren. She was a she was doing her PhD in some something to do with worms. Uh, she was definitely in some sort of biology um, thing. And I have this uh, fascina fascination with worms too. I do like uh, vermicomposting. It's one of my one of the things I've been doing for about ten years. I just I, I still like even to this day. I have my worm bin in the back. I have my worm bin at work, and uh, I'm just fascinated by them. And we just hit it off right away. I guess one thing led to another, and uh, we came up to the conversation of uh, my uh, CTCL. And she's like, "Do you have your your blood work with you?" And I said, "Yeah, I have about you know a stack of blood work about this high." For over the past day, she's like, "Do you mind if I look at them?" And I said, "No problem." So I gave her my blood work. I started looking through them. She noticed that my eosinophils, eosinophils, mm -hmm. the type of white blood cell, was very high, above, like way beyond the the normal range over the past ten years, consistently every single blood test. And she's like, "Have you noticed? Has anybody ever told you about these kinds of blood cells?" I said, "No, nobody ever really talked to me about them." And she said, well, these blood cells, they are responsible. Uh, they're kind of like a reaction your body's having to either an, something that you're allergic to or uh, inflammation. And she's like, have you ever tried doing an elimination diet? And just again, that past week, I had listened to the podcast with Michaela Peterson. And I said, no, but very open to trying it, you know. And I was actually thinking about doing a carnivore diet. And she's like, yeah, you should try that, see if it helps. And after talking to my dermatologist as well, telling her about the uh, about what I want to do, she said, yeah, it's no problem for a month. You know, nothing's going to happen to you. You could try it out. Uh, for the next month, I ate nothing but red meat. And at that time in Crete, you could get an entire lamb's head for one euro which was really, really great. I, I used to eat four heads a day when I started. I've, I've since then, I've gotten away from that because you know, after you eat something too much, you kind of get sick of it. So I, don't, I can't remember the last time I've had a lamb's head, but at that time, it was like, a, it was great. After a month, I did a blood test again. And for the first time in 10 years, my white blood cells were all perfect. They were all normal. Uh, well, they're a little, a little bit on the high end, you know, slightly on the high end of, of the normal range, but none of them were off off the normal range. So I decided to keep at it. And uh, I did the carnivore diet for about a year and a half with, I think I had maybe four cheat days. And it was, yeah, I, I had never been in a in better shape in my entire life. I was ripped. I was, you know, like strong. I was uh, sleeping way less than I, uh, than I normally did, full of energy. The only bad thing was my libido was really low. My sleep, I slept a little, uh, a little bit less than uh, I normally did, but um, and you know, you know, going to the bathroom was a little bit of a uh, adjustment. But other than that, yeah, I had, it was a, it was a really great, it was a really great year and a half. And when when was that? What year was that? Do you remember? It was right before COVID, so 2018. Okay, 2018. Yeah, and and also my, I had sorry to interrupt you. It was um, uh, I also had I was really depressed, you know, as I told you, but. And it was to the point where I just didn't want to, didn't want to go on. It was like, I had like every, every, every thought of the future that I had was just bad. And within that month, I felt great. I started like really having a positive outlook on life and uh, things started turning around for me. And uh, yeah, that was also uh, another thing that really kind of made me keep going uh, was because I just, my, my mental state was so great. So how did the, uh, I mean, how long had it been since the, 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 the cutaneous T-cell lymphoma was sort of in remission that you went carnivore? So the patches were going away. Um, like I, I, I'd sort of get remissions once in a while. So like, like they, they would always present themselves around my waist. So from right next to my groin to begin with, they kind of went around towards uh, my glutes. But they were getting smaller and they were getting less kind of itchy ever since the carnivore diet. Uh, I, I haven't had any patches. I haven't had any itching or any kind of, like I haven't noticed anything. Uh, so I think, uh, like, is it in remission? I think so. I haven't had any biopsies taken recently, uh, cause there isn't anything to take a biopsy from. I'm going to say like from about, yeah, about uh, around that time, uh, around the time I started, 
carnivore uh, is when I really noticed one of the last patches, maybe, maybe a little bit into carnivore diet, maybe like, maybe a few months into it, I might have noticed a patch, but since then, nothing, really nothing. Yeah. Okay. So it's so it's fair to say that at least since doing that, it's it's sort of gone away and hasn't come back. What? Yeah. So you said you did a, a fairly strict carnivore for about a year and a half. What did you transition to, and what do you what are you doing these days? I met this really uh, amazing uh, girl. Uh, we're still together. About three years ago, I was full carnivore when I met her, and I and she actually followed me for about a month, and uh, we took before and after pictures, and really she looked like it's night and day she looked really really great after the month but we decided to take a little like a um, vacation to Sandorini uh, for a month and you know when you travel it's a little bit harder to be carnivore especially you know when you're you know you're going to restaurants you know you're you're grabbing something to go uh, so I, I stopped at that time and you know it was it was kind of fun but I noticed something really interesting which is that my whole life, I was always under the impression that after you eat, you kind of have this pain in your stomach, you know, where you eat. And, and I associated that with being satiated. During my carnivore diet, I would, uh, like certain days, I, I counted how many kilos of meat I ate. I would eat three kilos in a day. Mm. And sometimes I would eat, I would literally come home from the butcher and I, have, I had a great relationship with my butcher. And uh, we're, we're actually friends still today. And I still shop at his shop, even though he switched uh, locations. And I went, to, uh, I went to see him one day and I, and I said, I'm really, really, really hungry today. And I really feel like eating something raw. Can you give me a piece of meat that I could eat raw? And he's like, yeah, sure. So uh, he brought out this really, really lean uh, piece of beef. And I had no idea at the time about the correlation between eating fat and being satiated. I didn't know about that. So I get home with about at least two kilos of meat, and I take out this piece of, of raw meat, and my body just, it just, I mean, the type of hunger I had was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was irresistible. I just started cutting that thing up and throwing it down my mouth. I, I, I kind of, I, if somebody was watching me, they'd, they'd, probably, they'd probably associate me with the, like an alligator getting pieces of meat thrown in its mouth and just swallowing them. So I just ate that kilo of meat standing up. And only later did I find out that fat is really important uh, to include in your diet. And actually, uh, it's, the, it's really important to eat it first. Uh, so uh, I started eating that. I started doing that a little bit more. And, and I ended up uh, really, really reducing the amount of meat that I, uh, that I was eating. And uh, where am I going with this, Sean? I don't really remember what the question was. Well, you you said you try to figure out what you transition to, where your diet. Oh, right. What am I doing now? Yeah. Right. right. So, yeah. So I ended up uh, after, you know, like um, now, now my girlfriend's living in France. So I'm, I'm traveling to, to visit her. And uh, so I'm not doing 100% carnivore anymore uh, just because it's not as convenient uh it's really only convenient if you're living if i'm living at home mm -hmm. i go to my butcher I, I i shop only one thing i just shop for meat and salt and that's it and it's so easy you know when you're you just go to your butcher come back home and that's it but with you know my girlfriend and uh, she loves eating and i love cooking so like i mean I, i'm gonna cook up tons of different dishes for her especially traditional greek dishes which i learned uh, living with my mom from a young age and uh it just became more of a speculative carnivore so like i'm, I'm eating maybe right now when i'm by myself i ate about 95 percent meat if not more when i'm living with my girlfriend i'm more like an 80 75 percent carnivore uh, and i do notice that i don't feel as good when i when i'm eating anything but 100 percent pure meat i feel a little bit a little bit a little, little pain a little bloating i could i get more fatigued you know so I try to keep it uh, as high as possible. Do you know um, if there's any, any you know, like, like when you said you're about 80%, so within that 20% or are, are some things worse than others? I mean, you notice like, you know. I've noticed that, yeah, wheat and bread and sugars are, I, I, mostly wheat, I think. Mostly like that's, uh, that gives me more of a, uh, of a pain. Like if I had to choose uh, what to eat with my meat, I would choose rice. I, I like, you know, um, uh, the cow rice, the, uh, the sushi rice. 
I have a rice cooker and I, what I do, this is a great thing about being Preet as well, is that your butcher will uh, give you lots of freebies. Like nobody here, like everybody here is kind of brainwashed into thinking that fat's bad. So like he has these, like just tons of fat at the end of the day. I'll ask him, Hey, can I get some fat? He's like, sure. And he'll bring me the, um, you know, the skirt from, uh, from lambs, which is fantastic fat, or he'll just throw in some kidneys, which have that great fat around it, you know, uh, as a bonus. Or uh, if I ask him, Hey, do you have any bones? Uh, he'll come out with like these like femurs from, from cows. He'd cut them up, throw them in a big bag and just give them to me. And uh, what I would do is I would make soups, a lot of soups. And I would use that uh, whenever I would decide to make rice, even for other people, I would always use the bone broth from that soup to make the rice in my rice cooker. So yeah, if I had to choose uh, something to eat other than, uh, uh, than meat, it would, it would be rice. Uh, other than that, uh, yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll crave uh, uh, an orange, you know, sometimes I'll crave some lemon, sometimes I'll crave some uh, a banana. You know, and also in Crete, we have lots of avocados that just like I have this tree right behind to, uh, uh, my shop that uh, is a massive avocado tree, you know, and it's like they're just falling on the ground. And it's kind of like I just I'll grab some, I'll take them home and, and, and I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll eat some avocados as well. Yes. But generally speaking, yeah, if I had to choose one thing, yeah, I'd definitely be uh, definitely be beef. How has, uh, you know, I guess you said you had a period of time with, with depression, obviously, with you know, relationship stuff and things like that. How has your mental health been since, uh, you know, going from, well, I mean, going from vegan at the extreme, you know, years ago when you got this T cell lymphoma to now, I mean, in, improvements in mental health overall. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, at one point, uh, I was, I was so depressed. I mean, um, it just, I didn't, yeah, I just didn't want to go on. I was like, I can't, I, I can't, I can't live with this kind of this kind of world, you know, and being in the situation I was when you're involved in a uh, kind of like a legal battle and uh, just the, some of the worst in people comes out, you know, people that that you've met once or twice coming out lying about you, people uh, that you've known for a long time, you know, like my ex and everything was great and everything was fine. Uh, she just wanted to move back to Canada. She never told me. And I was like, I, I find out when she doesn't come back and then she becomes a person that is just, you just, you just question how, how jaded, I mean, or, or how, how much of an idiot am I to believe that this person was worthy of, of me loving her? You know, like how could this person that, that I used to love be so bad or so like, you know, like have these like lie about so many things about me and then have everybody around her, like all these other women that have met me once or twice come and like support her and, and build this mountain of lies about me. And I'm just, I can't, I just, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be part of this world. It's just, if you, if you, if this is what it's about, I mean, no, thank you. But yeah, after, after becoming carnivore, it just, I look at them now and I'm, I, I, I kind of laugh and I kind of feel sorry for them because I was like that too. When I was vegan, if I met me today, back then I'd fist fight me. I would, I, I would fight myself. Because I would call myself, you're such an idiot. What are you doing? Why are you eating meat? And I was that guy that was in a restaurant and was kind of like, ugh, look at that meat eater, you know, like this tofu is so delicious, you know, like, and I'm kind of judging them and being, and if anybody that, you know, if, if anybody's listening that I've judged before, I'm so sorry. I was, so, I mean, I was so wrong. And, and I, I really, I really feel bad about the person I was back then, but I was also very kind of like, combative you know like i would i want to take that meat eater and you know like string them up and be like you know so i kind of understand how those people think i guess i mean i understand so i was kind of like that um but nowadays i just i have more of a you know let's say fair attitude i'm like you know what you go in your own path you know i'm gonna go on my own path i'm gonna pursue my my path in life and hope for the best. And I really, I can't really explain it, Sean. I don't, I don't really know what's like, what's changed, but I just don't feel depressed anymore. I don't feel like I need to get somebody back or judge somebody or I just, I just feel good. Like yeah. I start to explain. Yeah. Fair enough. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, as I constantly <laughs> interact with people that, <clears throat> you know, were where you were 10 years ago or whenever you were vegan and, and they, they, you know, they just have this, belief that they are unequivocally right and everybody yeah. else is wrong and that you know we're all be you know evil people and things like that yeah i mean it's you know i i you know i i've never been to 
to Crete. Uh, but I mean, I imagine it seems like it's a kind of an older way of doing things and people, I mean, is veganism big on Crete? Is there, is there a big component of that or is it kind of like, not really? You know, not, yes and no. The old Cretan, Cretan men, especially, you know, those, those, uh, um, in, in Texas, you have the good old boys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, over here, we have the, the mountain men who are like the farmers and the shepherds and the, you know, you see them coming down with these, you know, like, uh, we call them agudas and they're like these kind of like, uh, you know, what the shepherds have with that little, the crook. And uh, they would still hold them in, in town dressed all in black. And uh, one of the things that they say is that if meat is not on the table, I don't sit down. So they're hardcore meat eaters. Like they just, they don't, they, there's, that's non-negotiable, which is funny because we're also uh, very religious in Crete. Uh, and during this time, right now we have Lent uh, and during Lent, you're not supposed to eat any, any animal products that includes dairy, that includes, you know, certain types of fish It turned, it includes all, obviously any kind of uh, land animal, but these guys, they don't care. They're like, no, I'm still going to eat meat every day of the day, every day of the year. And yet there's the other side, which is kind of like the new, I guess, the new age people, I guess, the, the younger kids, uh, which you will find. Uh, and there is a, there are fantastic vegan restaurants in Crete uh, due to the fact that we do have this tradition of the Lent period of the 40 days during Easter, the 15 or 20, I don't know how many days in, in Christmas. So we have this kind of tradition where every, I think it's every Wednesday, you don't eat meat. So we have these like really, really strong vegan um, culinary traditions. So yes and no, Sean. I don't. I can't really say if it's if it's like really popular now or not. But it's kind of always been, but never to the point where they will not eat any meat. That's just or Cretan. That's uh, that's a ridiculous, ridiculous thing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you mentioned the, the the period of Lent, but apparently, you know, back in the days of Ansel Keys, one of the times he was trying to assess the dietary intake of Crete as one of his studies, one of his places he looked at to determine heart disease. And he observed Crete during Lent and assumed no one ate much meat. And therefore, that's why they had better health outcomes. And <laughs> really, it was, it was because you know he was there during Lent when no one was eating this stuff. And so you didn't get the full picture. So it's one of those interesting, uh, interesting uh, just bits of history that, that goes with that. Do you have a lot of beef in Crete? Is it or is it mostly lamb and goat? Locally grown, it's, it's yeah, about, I would say 90%, maybe more uh, lamb, goat, sheep. Um, but there are some cows. Uh, we do have uh, cows that are uh, that are in mainland Greece, which we import. We import a lot of uh, beef from France and Holland. No, no, no. We, we import a lot of pork from Holland, a lot of beef from France. But it's getting bigger. It's getting like the beef industry in Greece is getting bigger, stronger, and better. Because back, I mean, when I started, uh, when, when I started living here, uh, Greek beef was like meh, French, amazing, great. Now, if I see Greek beef at my butchers, uh, I'm I'm choosing that nine times out of ten. It's just it's really great. So in Crete, uh, not so much beef, but in Greece, it's uh, it's getting more and better. Yeah, that's 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 good to hear. You know, outside of dietary changes i mean are you still out there doing the sunbathing and stuff every day or what is what is your not so much no i'm, I'm actually uh starting a, a business right now it's taking a lot of my time and i'm working you know i'm still still working as a teacher so i have a lot of uh, that's just you know what that's just excuses i just don't make the time for it i don't find it as i guess i'm not as uh, concerned about it any, anymore yeah i'll try to i mean I, I love going to the sea especially on a hot day my girlfriend's visiting. We we go to the beach way more often than when I'm living on my own. But no, to be honest, I'm not. I'm not taking it as serious as I should be. To be honest, uh, I really should suntan more, but I, I don't really. Well, I mean, it's it's. Uh, how far are you from the from the water where you live? Is it walking distance like, or? I could throw a stone really really hard and I could hit it that way. Yeah, wow. I'm right outside of the old town of Chania, relatively close to uh, to walking distance. Yeah, I could walk the beach. I could walk the water here in about in less than five minutes. Yeah, well, that would that seems like a nice nice place to be, and I, I think I'd be yeah. spend a lot of days getting up in the morning and going to the beach for a nice walk. That's where are you located? I didn't ask you. Uh, I'm in part of the world I'm in Washington in. State right now, so I'm in the Pacific Northwest. So very very different, very different climate. You know, it's kind of I mean, it's pretty. I mean, it's very pretty. We have a few mountain nice mountains from the backyard we can see, and uh, that's temperate stuff, rainforest is one of my favorite environments in the world. I, I was up in BC uh, about yeah. uh, 15 years ago, and yeah. you know the sequoias are just yeah. not they're fantastic. It's mm -hmm. it's a great for nature lovers. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I can I can't imagine. 
a, a better place to be than Washington State, State or, or BC or yeah, that's you know. it's pretty. I mean, it's definitely it definitely's got its advantages for sure. Do you still interact with physicians? I mean, do you still see a doctor or do you just <clears throat> not really? Or when's the last nah, time? Nah, not so much. The last time I saw a doc, well. I went recently, I had a motorcycle accident. So I, I went recently for like uh, osteopathic stuff, but nothing, uh, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not as, as good as I should be with my own health, um, to be honest. But my, the last blood test I did, I think was in 2022 or 21. Uh, and everything was spot on. I think I had a little, my, my cholesterol was a little bit high from what I remember, but uh, uh, yeah, I don't really, no, I don't really go to doctors. Almost I have to. Do, are you worried about it because you're eating a lot of meat, 80% or more, sometimes strict carnivore? Are you worried mm -hmm. about getting heart disease or anything like that? Not really. I played semi-professional football for uh, for a few years. Uh, I've always been, you know, going to the gym. I've always kind of uh, – the only thing that the doctors ever told me was my heart was a little bit too big for my for my body. Other than that, I've always had, like, really, really good checkups. I've had a few surgeries for my for meniscus. I've had a few. I've had a surgery for my wrist, but that was all like mechanical stuff. It wasn't really metabolic stuff. Uh, the only real metabolic uh, problem I've had was uh, was my CTCL. Um, so yeah, I'm not too concerned, and that maybe I should be, but it's kind of like sometimes you look at yourself like you're in a movie. You're like, why are you doing this? Like you should you shouldn't you should be sleeping earlier. You should be like going to doctors more often. And I just I don't understand why I don't, but I I, I just don't go. I don't. I don't feel like I have to. Well, you know, I mean, I think that's honestly quite fair. I mean, I think that uh, we have gotten to where we probably overutilize the healthcare system with the, with the sort of the annual checkup when most of the time it's unnecessary, in, in, in my view anyway. So what, you know, back, I guess, what caused you to go vegan back in the day? What, 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 <coughs> what was the impetus to get you on it? Was it a health concern? Was it uh, something Good else? Question. I, I still question that myself as well. I, I still wonder why I did it. Uh, I think it has. It was a combination of um, kind of social pressure combined with a type of anti-authoritarian tilt, uh, kind of with some influence of you know of wanting to do something to help. I guess the environment, the health, maybe, yeah, possibly. But I think it was most. I think eighty percent of it was kind of social pressure. I want to kind of have the like the moral high ground, you know, like I want it to be a little bit more uh, like, Hey, look at me, I'm doing something. I'm, I'm trying, I'm, you know, like follow me. Uh, let's, let's, you know, save the world. You know, let's, I think that was more of uh, of the reason than anything else. And uh, since then, I mean, I'm really, really compassionate with people that are, that are vegan. I'm really like, you know, wow, I was there, you know, like good luck, you know, like, I hope, I hope you find your way out of that, you know, like, but I understand that I can't, I can't say anything to you that's going to make sense to you. Because if, if I was in your shoes when I was vegan, I would think everything you're saying is just bollocks. It's just, you know, I, I wouldn't listen to you. My ears would be closed. So, um, but I've met some, some vegans who are like really, really, really horrible people um, due to the fact that they're imposing it onto their children uh, from a young age. To me, that's the, that's the greatest crime to me that, that a vegan could, could ever impose on, on somebody. It's an, an innocent child, you know, like it's, uh, yeah, you think you're doing the right thing for yourself, but that's not a choice that, that a baby can make. And you don't have the, you know, you're the mom or the dad, but you don't have the moral authority to make that kind of choice for, for an infant, especially, you know, like when we know now that, you know, not feeding children, even, even a, a, a pregnant woman, you know, not eating meat will affect the child. So it's like, I just, I, I think I, I have a lot of compassion for them, but at the same time, uh, there's like a, a point which if you cross, it really, really bothers me. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, we're seeing more and more information coming out on, you know, some of the problems associated with the diet, you know, with uh, cognitive issues, mental health issues, fracture, um, healing issues, all kinds of potential deficiencies and particularly with the kiddos, you know, it's kind of uh, uh, concerning. And I mean, there's, they, they, they always refer to this one 2016 paper by the, the uh, uh, National Association of Dietetics and Nutritionists in the U.S. where they say it was appropriate for all ages and stages. And yet all three authors were vegan. Most of the reviewers were vegan on that thing. So it was a very biased study 
Uh, and we've got you know position papers from all over the world, from Germany, from Italy, from Sweden, from Belgium, you know, many, many countries saying that, no, 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 this is a, this is a big problem for kids. And so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. How would and you can see it too. I mean, you see children that are that are that have been vegan for their whole lives, mm -hmm. and you you see the difference in their you know skeletal development and their their you know they're just so thin and like their eyes are sunken. I mean, the the, the one particular example of I, I've actually only to be honest, I only have two children that I know that were vegan their whole lives. Uh, they are on the, on the, on the creed. And I look at them and I just, my heart breaks for them. And I mean, it's just, it's cruel, you know, like it just, it's just, you could see that they're underdeveloped, you know, an eight year old boy that looks like he's, you know, five, mm -hmm. uh, a, a 14 year old girl that looks like she's, you know, 12 and they're just like thin and, and that just, just breaks my heart, you know? Yeah. You wonder how much, you know, how much long-term, you know, damage they're going to have with that. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. it is, it is kind of, kind of a shame. And, you know, it's, you know, like, well, at least they don't have heart to, you know, it's like, they don't have heart disease, you know, <laughs> which is, yes. I mean, they're young. They're like 12 years old. Well, that's the thing. I mean, it's like, you Who knows? Why, why are you protecting your four-year-old from heart disease? They don't get it anyway, regardless, even if, even if you were worried about that, it's kind of, but that, that's kind of like what I was, I was, I think it's more of a moral high ground issue. They're like, Hey, we're doing this because animals have feelings and we need to protect them and we don't have the right to use them for our, our purposes which is why a lot of vegans they don't wear leather they don't they don't use animal products or they don't use products that have been you know you know tested on on animals or whatever so i think it's more of a moral thing for them you know like so i don't know and it's like a religion i guess you know like uh if uh your, your whole life you were taught that uh you know like uh, blowing yourself up in the name of a deity will get you into paradise you're gonna believe that uh if because you have no you have no mental defenses uh, at that age. And if you're drilled that into your head from when you're young, by the time you're eight years old, you're ready to, you know, blow yourself up. And it's, uh, it's, I think that's another type of cruelty, another type of, uh, another level of cruelty, you know, like it's the mental part, the brainwashing part that is just, to me, almost as bad as a health thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. The cuisine in Crete, this is considered one of these longevity places, I believe. What what are the, what do the locals eat there? Okay, so this is a, I think the best example of I guess the best food would be when you're at a wedding, because that's when you know they shut down the entire village, the, the whole city shuts down. Everybody's invited, and they just you know party for the whole night. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, Crete is known for is something called Antichristo, which is they build this giant frame, metal frame, in a circle, and they pile uh, wood in the middle. They burn that wood, turns it to embers, and then they cover this whole structure with with meat, with uh, with lamb or goat. And that's the, I guess, traditional, that has to be part of a wedding. The other thing that has to be part of a wedding is something called ramopilazo, which is so it's, there's sheep and uh, uh, ram. So it's ram. I think it's ram that they boil in these big pots, and they take that uh, the juice and they make rice with it, which is called pilafi, and they serve that with the boiled meat. So those two things are an absolute must-have for Cretan weddings, and that is what most of the food is based around. Obviously, you have the other stuff, the sweets and the uh, I mean, Crete is very, very, very widely regarded uh, as one of the best places to gather wild herbs and uh, and and um, uh, foraging wild greens. I think we have some like 18 types of uh, wild gathered greens that we boil uh, and 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 we serve as kind of like the the side dish uh, for a uh, uh, for your main meal, which is obviously always going to have meat in it. Uh, the other thing that we're very, very famous for is cheeses, Caraviera, uh, widely regarded uh, uh, as by many people as the best cheese in the world. Uh, the reason why is because the the goats or the or, or the sheep graze on wild herbs, and Crete is uh, they kind of absorb those wild herbs, those those, those tastes and those aromas, and they uh, they make cheese from their uh, from that milk. Another very, very famous thing is called staka. Uh, staka is kind of like the, uh, the best parts of 
ghee, which is like clarified butter, mm-hmm. cheese, and milk. So we, they make this kind of, um, it's a dairy product, and uh, they combine it with, uh, they heat it up, they combine it with flour, and then you cook eggs in it or French fries or whatever, or, or you just you, or you just dip it with uh, with bread. Another famous thing we have here is dacos, uh, which is a um, barley uh, bread, which has been cooked twice, so it becomes very hard, and they uh, grate tomatoes on it, um, uh, then they drizzle it, they drown it in olive oil, Crete, by the way, um, we consume an average of 21 liters of olive oil per person per year. The next closest population uh, for olive oil consumption is uh, Greeks, which uh, they have, uh, I think, right between 16 and 18. And after them, it's Spanish and Italian. So mm-hmm. Crete is, is uh, as far as olive oil use is concerned, way, way beyond uh, any other uh, culture in the world. We use olive oil in absolutely everything. And, and today, uh, I still have, like I, like I told you, I have about 20 olive trees that I make olive oil from. So that's one of the things that I uh, that I do use uh, still. I didn't use it while I was on my on the carnivore diet for the year and a half, but now uh, I do use a lot of olive oil as well. So I'll, I'll, avocados, olive oil. I'll put olive oil on my meat. You know. Yeah, and, um, and it's it's you know nice to see that it's, it's actual olive oil because I know a lot of the a lot of the olive oil on the, on the international market is. Is is adulterated and it's like fake. It's mostly yeah. something. Yeah, else. especially so the Italians come here every year with like uh, with the suitcases full of cash, and they come here and they buy all of our best olive oil. They go back to Italy, and then again, uh, this is just rumors. I have no proof, so like there's no. Uh, but apparently, what they do is they they combine it with other vegetable oils, and they mm-hmm. call it olive oil because the quality of the Greek olive oil, the Greek olive oil is such high quality that it will make regular oil taste like olive oil. So. That's apparently what happens. I know there's a huge scandal. There's lots of, uh, of, uh, of cases where in Italy, they found that they just colored canola oil and they put kind of like little additions of flavors in them and they sold it as olive oil. So there has been a lot of scandals. But yeah, I mean, I take my olives to the mill. I see the olives go through it. I get my olive oil. I go home and I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty neat. You can make your own stuff yeah. like that. Uh, one thing you mentioned, you know, on carnivore, your libido was a little lower. Do you know what was going on with there? Was it because you lost a lot of weight or weren't eating enough? Or what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I didn't lose too much weight. I was still, uh, I was exercising fine. Um, I don't know. It just, uh, even, even now when I, uh, if I start eating more uh, or I, I should eat less meat, I find that my libido increases. Uh, why? I have no idea. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, one theory is that maybe because, you know, maybe our ancestors, uh, if they started eating things other than meat, maybe it was an indication that times are tough. So like reproduce now because you might be done, you know, like that might be kind of a mechanism an evolutionary mechanism. I don't know really. Uh, but there is a difference, uh, for sure. There is a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Often. And I think it's, I think it's great for me because I mean, when I was younger, even, I mean, I was obsessed with getting laid all the time. I'd be like, that's, that was like my, my mission when I went outside. And it, it's, it's just not, it's not a really, not a really good way of going through life. You know, it's, uh, there's other things to, to focus on, right? Well, so for mean, me, it's it, great. It, I, it, I think it's, I think it's a bonus. I mean, it helps with the survival of the species if you have a sex drive. So, I mean, I think that's kind of a important aspect of it. But yeah, I mean, I'm in, in kind of interesting, a lot of people, in, in fact, most people I've talked to have the opposite effect. They, they see that their libido actually improves by going carnal, but I guess it depends what the relative diet was before, you know, potentially. I suppose. Could be. Do you spend much time on social media talking about this stuff or are you kind of just, just doing nah. things? Okay. No, I'm not really into social media. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I've started, um, I've started getting back into it. I want to promote, uh, I don't know if I could plug my, um, my business, but I'm starting a cigar, a cigar lounge in Crete and Kanya. So I'm getting, I'm getting back into it just so I could start, you know, uh, getting it out there. Yeah. Um, but other than that, no, I, I really try to avoid it. Um, at one point, you know, I spent a lot of time on, on Facebook and, uh, Instagram, but no, yeah, not really. A lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot of time, time wasted on, on those things for sure. I can see. Yeah. That. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, so you said you've got a, you said a cigar lounge. What's it? What's uh, yeah. Well, it's, I'm, I'm building it right now. Actually. It's, um, it's, uh, hopefully going to be open by May 1st. Mm-hmm. It's called premium puffs or maybe the premium puff. I haven't decided yet. Um, but yeah, it's going to be in Kenya. Uh, there's already a few places that sell cigars, but no real place where you could, 
you know, go chill and uh, I'm building a nice big walk-in humidor. Uh, so if you ever do come to, to Crete uh, after May and uh, it's up and running, I'd be very happy to have you over. Interesting. Okay. Well, maybe we, we haven't figured out where we're going to go in Greece yet outside of the, the couple And yes, time. amazing. Crete is amazing. Yeah. I mean, just I think three out of the top 10 beaches in the world are in Crete. And uh, one of them, uh, actually, uh, one of them is close to to the airport, about uh, 50 minutes from the airport. It's called Seitan Limaina. But to be honest, uh, because it's had such a a really good uh, reputation over the past 10 years, it's a really small beach, so it's way too crowded now. Back when I when I first came to Crete, uh, I actually had to canyon. Uh, we were doing canyoning. We got we had to canyon down down a, a ravine to get to uh, Seitan Limaina. And again, just nobody there, you know, like it was fantastic. But over the past 10 years, it's been one of those like secret beaches. And now it's, I guess, social media. Uh, I don't know what it is, but uh, mm-hmm. in the summer, it's just jam packed. And, you know, the other very, very famous beach is La Fonisi. Uh, I think it gets something like, I don't know, maybe 5 million visitors a year. It's a, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a, an insanely popular beach. And of course, there's Balos, which is a lagoon, which is also uh, one of the best in the world, uh, fantastic beaches here in Crete for sure. Well, we're going to be at that, that, that part of the world in August. And so that's kind of like main, main vacation time for Europe. I know everybody's on vacation in August. I'm sure. Well, enjoy. It's great. So, if you need any, any tips or advice, uh, please let me know. I'd be very happy to, to tell you where to go. Well, very good. Yeah. We've got, we've got a couple from, from Greece that are going to be hosting us in Athens or the marathon actually. So anyway, well, I'll tell you what, Pavlos, this has been very interesting. Thank you uh, for sharing and doing this. I do, you know, we're about running out of time, but uh, really appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It was great. Uh, great meeting you. Great talking to you. All right, folks. We'll see everybody tomorrow. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now.